Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Pastor James. And again, I thank you for watching this video. I pray that whenever you watch this video, that it'll bless your heart and reach you and encourage you to glorify and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and draw you more passionately uh, closer to him. If I can, once again, let me encourage you to click on the what I'm calling the evangelize button or the share button down below and trust as you do so that this message may reach and touch and minister to somebody on your friends list, maybe at a very crucial time in their life. Today's scripture, I want to talk about a topic that is uh, not very popular. It's called, uh, it's on divorce, but not necessarily about divorce, but about marriage. And not necessarily for those who are married, but the idea that God is establishing the Word of God and one that He even uses for the context of His church. I heard a message similar to what I'm going over recently on the radio, and I said, I want to preach on that. So if I could try to endeavor to do so, uh, if we can, grab your Bibles and take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 2. This is the book of what the Hebrew Bible says, the book of beginnings. And you're going to find the beginning of a very important relationship between man and woman. This is Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that, he, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast or cling to his wife, and, the, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and were not ashamed. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk about this passage and all that it might be saying to us. Uh, and before you uh, tune away, because maybe you think, I've been married 30, 40, 50, 60 years, or um, I'm, uh, I already know these things, or even you don't plan on being married, I want to say that a proper understanding of this passage in the context of what God has designed, you will see, has New Testament and church implications as well. And I'd like to draw that out and encourage you, because often when we have a false understanding of something, it will affect our relationship or our understanding later down the road. We want to lay a good foundation. You know, when you're a hair out of square, it will affect uh, much more than just simply that one line. It'll affect the whole development of the house or the building or whatever it is you're trying to design or lay down. And so let us not be a hair out of the square when it comes to understanding what God has established in the context of marriage, the union of man and woman, woman, but also the idea that he uses in the New Testament in regards to the bride or the church. Again, the marriage motif or the covenant there. Before I go any further, I just want to point at something that we could quickly gloss over. And that's why it behooves us as God's people to spend time with the Word of God and to allow ourselves to dwell and to mull over it and to allow it to speak to our hearts and the Holy Spirit to be a part of that process. You know, we are never what we once be were as men. I'm speaking to you men out there. The Scripture says that Adam... Um, had a rib taken from him and God created the woman from this rib, meaning that there is no man out there that it now exists as he once was, meaning that something has been taken from us and from that the woman has been made. And only in that when we are united in holy matrimony, when we come together with that woman, are we really in a sense one and back to re or restore to our original state that there is a completion and a unity and a oneness between a man and a woman. And this is vital. And this is why we seek to protect it and why the Word of God says that God hates marriage. In the passage that we often read, what God has put together, let no man tear apart. Because there's something that's wonderful that goes on in this statement. And Adam says, as bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And so a man will leave his father and mother 
and will cleave to his wife, and the two will become one. I want to talk about that passage here in verse 24, this leaving uh, we see in this, and this is where I want to draw out the image of the church, the idea that the identity of the man is no longer in identity with, with his mother and his father, the relationship there, even though he's still going to be a son to both his father and mother and a brother to his sisters and other siblings, but he will take on a new identity. He will be beholden to one, in a sense, before them or greater than them. And so he will leave his father and mother, and he will cleave to this new one. In him he will identify, and she will identify. And the two who had separate identities now become one. And we see in that the image of the church, the image of, in a sense, even the born-again experience. How does the scriptures tell us? It tells us that the disciples left their nets, they left their livelihoods, and they followed Jesus. You know, we leave things behind. And Jesus says, if any man wishes to be my disciple, let him hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, even his own life, and follow me or to love me. And the imagery there is in the same context to not necessarily hate your father and mother, because we know Jesus would not teach that. He's teaching a concept here, a philosophy, of, a way of thinking that you will leave the former and you will now identify with me. You'll leave your father and your mother, your brothers and sisters, your, even your own life, and you will become one with me. You will be a follower of mine. And we see this as the, the beginning formation of what we see as discipleship. But not only discipleship, but the idea of the church. There are two passages I would like to read from the book of Revelation, which is interesting. It's the we have at the beginning of our Bible the formation of, of, of marriage between a man and a woman. But also in the book of Revelation, I'm going to read two passages that uh, this uh, imagery, this covenant is used in the context of Christ with the church. The first passage is in Revelation 21.9. It says, then, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and he spoke to me saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Did you hear those wonderful words? Come, I will show you the bride. Who is the bride? The scriptures refer that we're the bride, the church. And who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ, the Lamb, the spotless Lamb of God. Here we see an example of the imagery of the church, or the imagery of marriage, or the union of marriage, the this first covenant that we see in our Bible, the second covenant being that of the uh, rainbow and that the Lord would no longer flood the earth with water. But the first covenant we see is the covenant between man and woman and this marriage that goes on, this holy matrimony. And we see that that God has taken this image of, of, of two individuals leaving what is and, and putting behind them the identification that they had once before in choosing a new identification, one with another. And it's this idea of this marriage, and we see it used as a description for the church. That the church is the bride, and that we forsake those things and we become one, we come together. We see this also in Revelation 19, verse 9. And then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, we even know that there's a marriage supper. And who's going to be there? Well, we've got the bride, and of course we've got the groom. We have the Lamb of God, and we have the church. And so, so dear is the concept and the idea and the institution of marriage. You can see why now that the Lord says, let no man tear apart or tear asunder what God has put together, and that God hates divorce. Now, I know you've heard these passages and been browbeat with them, but there's a, there is a, a greater way of looking at the scriptures, looking at our union with our wife and understanding its context in the sense of our union with Christ and the born-again experience, and that we become, uh, we become that bride, that member of the church, his bride. And so when we err in our understanding of what the Lord has said about in the beginning in Genesis, we err in understanding our context with the church, our context with the bride of Christ. And, 
and that is not a good place to be. Now, Paul saw it this way in Ephesians 5, I believe, verse 25. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. This idea of loving your wife like Christ loved the church. We see the idea of how does a husband love his wife. First of all, he should love his wife. But also the, the manner by which a man who sees his wife as, as bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, how he would endure and how he would love and how he would sacrifice for her. In the same way we see that image that Jesus Christ did at Calvary, that he gave his life for the church, for the lost. And that that is an image there that we need to understand. And so it says that when we understand our identity now in Christ, as we enter and understand our identity with our spouse, that we cleave to her. And I love these passages, the word cleave. You can see it uh, a number of different times in the New Testament, but uh, sorry, a number of times in the Old Testament. I'm going to read about three or four verses that have this word cleave. And I want you to see the imagery that is in discipleship, that's also you and a part of the Christian faith and the bride concept, but also in the context of marriage, because we're to cleave to our wife. This word is also used in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 4. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast or cleave to him. So we have this idea of fearing the Lord, holding fast to him, keeping his commandments, fearing him, keeping his commandments. Also Deuteronomy 11.22 For if you will be careful to do all the commandments that I have commanded you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways, and holding fast to him, or cleaving to him. Deuteronomy, or 2 Kings 18.6 for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments. We see this imagery of, of cleaving to the Lord connected with obedience, following, fearing the Lord. That there is a way that people like to try to dissect the word of God too much. They want to say you need to have faith or you need to have works. They want to push one or the other. But the scriptures talk in a holistic way. That when you cleave to the Lord, you follow his ways. When you cleave to the Lord, you, you keep his commandments. When you cleave to the Lord, you fear him. When you cleave to the Lord, you follow his statutes. And so this is the idea. When you love your wife, you don't do things that hurt your marriage. You don't go and give yourself to another woman or to another man. Which is interesting because the Bible refers to idolatry as adultery. And you can see that in the prophet, um, Hose, the prophet Hosea, who married Gomer. The idea that, that he married an unfaithful woman. And in, uh, he's a contrast that Israel's been unfaithful to God. That idolatry is the same as adultery. It's a, it's a transgression of the heart. And so we see this idea that following the Lord is, in a sense, it is the same thing of cleaving to our wife and loving her and protecting that relationship in the same way we, we cleave to the Lord and we keep the commandments. That's why Jesus said, if any man be my disciple, uh, sorry, if any man keep my commandments, he's my disciple indeed, and he shall know the truth, and the truth shall set him free. The idea of keeping the commandments of God is connected to loving God and cleaving to God. And so we can do both, not either or, but both. Uh, I like how James say it, says it, you know, it's not faith versus works, it's faith with works and faith without works. And he says, I'll show you my, my, my faith by how I live. And so how we understand marriage and cleaving to our wife. Now, in marriage there is communication. And I love the, the five basic ways that psychiatrists or psychologists tell us that we can communicate. And you're going to see that in verse 24. It doesn't use the word communicate, but it talks about being naked, that there was no shame, that they saw each other. And um, the first form of communication is a cliche. You know how it is. Uh, how, how are you doing? Can't complain. Or it's a nice day today. Sure is. And you just walk on. You say that to somebody on your way to church. You say it to someone in the grocery store line. You say it to somebody at the, at the gas pump. Looks like a nice day. It looks like it might rain. 
no, no real communication, just a cliche. The next one is maybe sharing a fax. Oh, did you hear about the game last night? No, I didn't. Oh, the, the Raiders won by seven points in overtime. Oh, okay. Just sharing a fact. Or maybe it's about politics. You hear about what happened down in Florida with that new law they passed? No, I didn't. Here it is. Blah. You know, we, we just spew out facts and information. Um, which is okay, but it's not very deep, is it? You can have those with someone who really even hates you or doesn't like you. You can have that level of sharing. The next one is maybe more of a sharing our ideas and our opinions. This is an intellectual uh, level, perhaps talking about something in the news, perhaps talking about what uh, some uh, state voted on, and you can have your pros and cons and talk about it and say it's unconstitutional, or you can say that the, the that it goes against the Senate or goes against tradition or whatever it might be. You can have those debates. You can talk about the, the rapture, whether it's pre, mid, or post. You can talk about uh, all millennialism versus millennialism. You can talk about um, which uh, coach did a better job and with the uh, with the with your local football team you could those are intellectual conversations again uh, they can be spirited they can express a little bit of your personal sentiments in the sense that you either like a particular president or a politician or a particular coach or a particular uh, school board or whatever it might be you're talking about but it gives a little bit more but it's still not quite there is it and uh, some people think they have a great marriage or they get married because they say, well, we like the same movies. We like to go to the same restaurants. Uh, we like, to, we like to, the same uh, sports team. But the problem is, uh, what about when kids, kids come in? What about when it gets uh, the feelings kind of subside and you have to go through difficulties? And again, all marriages are difficult. There's no marriage that hasn't been difficult. Being united to somebody else is a sacrifice and it is a growing process so don't think you can leave one and go to another and it's going to be different that's a lie it takes courage to grow and that means that communication so you get to the next level which basically is an emotional level where you begin to share your 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 goals your dreams your your insecurities the things you hope for the things you'd like to accomplish the things you're afraid that you might mess up or or blunder this is a level of transparency that is, that is uh, a wonderful place, especially for my, men, to have a, a person that's in their corner, so to speak, one that they can allow themselves to take down that macho bravado that often we have to have that says, you know, men don't cry and uh, we're not afraid of nothing, to be able to have someone in, in our life that we can trust and say, you know what, I'm kind of winging it on a lot of things here. And uh, to be honest, I'm scared. I'm scared about this operation I got to go into. I'm scared of uh, the, what the doctor said. I'm scared that my job might go. I'm scared that my kids may not respect me. I'm, I'm scared that I can't pay the bills. I'm scared of whatever it might be, or even goals, what you want to do. Uh, these types of things to show your insecurities, your transparency. Uh, this is a wonderful place to be because then your spouse can be someone who can speak to that thing that they see in you that maybe you don't see. I was just reading this in Moses. Uh, his mother saw that he was fine. You know, those people that love us, that we've let into our personal area, into that, that intimate place, they see things in us. They can encourage us. They can be a, they can be a, a Barnabas. They can be an uplifter, an encourager. And uh, our wives, our husbands are those things. But we have to get to that place that we have the intimacy and the sharing. And then finally, that, that oneness, they were naked, meaning that, that they saw each other as they were, but then they were also one. You know, that their goals are our goals, their fears are uh, what they struggle with, our strength comes. Uh, their hopes are our hopes, their dreams are our dreams. My dream is their dream or her dream. You know, there's this sharing, and so we are now working as one. And Christ says, just like you see me, you've seen the Father, and I and the Father are one, and now I've sent the Holy Spirit in you, and whatever I have, I give to Him, and He'll give it to you. And there's this oneness that we have in our relationship with Jesus Christ that the Lord does communicate to us through the Holy Spirit. But many of us have a prayer life that's like, like cliches. You know, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. We say it, and then we're like, see ya. And we say these prayers, you know. Uh, you know, thank you, Jesus, for this food. Amen. And we run off just as fast as the person at the uh, convenience store that we said, nice day. 
But perhaps we stick around in prayer and we begin to give a lot of facts. You know, so and so sick, Lord, and so and so's in the hospital. So and so has a dialysis coming on. So and so uh, lost their job. We're just sharing facts. But then maybe we go a little bit further. Lord, why? Why is this going on? Lord, why? Why did so and so lose their job? Why does so and so's kid have cancer? Lord, why? And we allow ourselves to be emotionally involved with the conversation with God, and then to allow ourselves to even be transparent, Lord. I'm afraid for that. I'm afraid for my, my wife. I'm afraid for my kid. I'm, I'm afraid for myself, Lord. Or, Lord, I, I, I want to see my son uh, graduate. I want to see my daughter uh, ex uh, excel in whatever she does, or my, my wife, or my, you know, we, that transparency. But then we are able to share our weaknesses, our fears, our, our, our misgivings, and our doubts. And the Lord is able to work in us and share that oneness. And the Lord says he's able to share his strength with us. To show us that he's our strength, our banner, our rampart, our shield, our buckler, our strong tower. All these things that, be, that were just simply words now become living life in us. In this relationship, just like with our spouse, in the sense we become bone of our bone with the Lord. Because we are born again. His spirit lives within us. And so Jesus Christ uses the example, and the Word of God uses the example of this blessed covenant of marriage to show the relationship with God and His people, with Jesus Christ and His church. So the better we have a right understanding of what it is in a holy matrimony between a man and a woman, we understand the relationship that Christ was drawing upon and the church has drawn upon in understanding our relationship with God. I pray that today's message has encouraged you. I pray that it has given you a desire to love your spouse more, to be more intimate with them, but also your relationship with the Father, your relationship with the Father through the Son, that the Holy Spirit would work in you and that you would spend time in prayer and get past the factual and the cliches and even the, the intellectual discussion, which is good, but getting into the meat of what's going on in our hearts, that we would have that relationship that not only touches here, but comes from here. I know the Lord desires it. I know the Lord greatly desires that with his people. And he's made every effort in every avenue to open up the doors the, the, the gates of heaven that we may enter in to the throne of grace with boldness. I hope today's message encouraged you. God bless you. God keep you. May God's face shine upon you. Amen.